Jacob Rahor from Lucy Labs. Did I get that right? You got that right. Hello. Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you? Good, good. So I'm excited to uh, have you talk about, uh, you know, the final topic, uh, you know, DeFi, we're, you know, we're talking all about decentralized finance and, you know, Uniswap's been one of the big, big, um, I think, successful stories. And so it's, uh, I think you have an interesting topic about Uniswap. Uh, feel free to give a little bit of background about yourself, but uh, um, you're going to talk about uh, Uniswap and, uh, you know, why, why these liquidity pro providers might be losing some money. Uh, so uh, I think this is a really interesting topic. So uh, feel free to take it away. You got, uh, you know, up to 10 minutes. And uh, thanks so much for coming. Jake. Sure. Go. Sure thing. So uh, a little bit of background. I'm the chief investment officer of Lucy Labs. We're a hedge fund. Uh, one of the strategies that we do is we provide liquidity on Uniswap uh, version two, as well as other uh, DeFi protocols. So we're, you know, we're intimately familiar with the economics of doing this. And uh, let's see if I can share. Uh, so I'm going to talk about why a Uniswap uh, liquidity provider is losing money on version three. And actually, perhaps I should first answer the question, why should anyone care? Um, the reason you should care is that uh, we're building this decentralized uh, uh, system where you can uh, cr uh, raise capital, you can trade assets, and we need to have decentralized uh, infrastructure to trade it on. Uh, Balaji Srinivasan talks about this DeFi matrix and the future of the world where you can have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of possible assets that are all trading permissionlessly against each other on a decentralized infrastructure uh, automated market makers like Uniswap. Uh, and in order to get to that point, we need to have uh, uh, Uniswap and other art market makers working well. In order for them to work well, uh, they are relying on liquidity providers uh, offering their capital and expecting some sort of return on capital. If that return on capital is negative, uh, liquidity providers are going to move away from it and you really won't be able to build this infrastructure. So I'm going to talk uh, really about the math of uh, being a liquidity provider. Uh, I promised June that I would not actually talk much about math. So I'm going to skip all the formulas and really just show everything in the form of charts. So let's first kind of get an introduction to Uniswap version 2. And this is uh, the sort of picture that uh, is fairly common. This is how Uniswap uh, is explained. Uh, Uniswap and all the other uh, constant product market makers uh, uh, provide a smart contract that allows you to trade and exchange one asset for another. In this case, we're going to use uh, USDT and Ethereum as those assets, but it could be really anything else. And the way these contracts work is that uh, all the permissible states of the contract are on this line. Let's say you start, uh, I start as a liquidity provider and I put in one Ethereum and 2000 USDT. So I'm at the point of the curve that's sitting in there. Um, and uh, that, uh, that corresponds to $2,000 price for Ethereum. Let's say that uh, by trading, you know, um, the price of Ethereum goes up to $4,000. At that point, you'll have 4,000 USDT and, uh, uh, and half an Ethereum in the contract. So. Uh, it's a uh, it's really kind of smart uh, and the way this was put together because this is a completely automated way of doing market making and providing liquidity to anyone out there in the world and it provides liquidity across the whole price range so ethereum price can go to infinity and, and this contract would still be out there quoting or it can go close to zero and the contract would still be quoting um, but what is happening and that's quite important is that as price changes the amount or the ratio of the uh, uh, of the different uh, asset changes. So if Ethereum price goes up, you will be getting less and less Ethereum in the contract. And if Ethereum price goes down, you'll be getting more and more Ethereum. And that's kind of important. So this curve is kind of how traders look at it. Uh, from a liquidity uh, point, of, uh, point of view, uh, it's actually interesting to look at slightly differently. Uh, as a liquidity provider, what, I'm, what I really care about is the value of the assets that I put into the pool and how that value depends on price of Ethereum in this case. So at the price of Ethereum at 2000, the value of the pool, uh, of the pool assets is 4000. It consists of one Ethereum and $2,000. You add it up, you get 4000. 
But as price of Ethereum changes, you see that uh, the value of my pool assets is going up and down based on this curve. And the important thing about this curve, it's, uh, you know, it's curvy. It's not a straight line. The reason it's curvy is uh, uh, you always get stuffed with the asset that you don't like. So if price of Ethereum goes up, people sort of take away your Ethereum and stuff you with US dollars and vice versa. If price of Ethereum goes down, people take away your Ethereum. Um, uh, sorry, they take away your US dollars and stuff you with Ethereum. So you have this like curvature in there. Um, and a way to look at that or, or sort of think about that curvature is compare this with the experience. If you just started with the original asset basket, you know, $2,000 and one Ethereum, what would be your experience? Uh, your experience would be the orange line, you know, as price of uh, Ethereum went down, you know, you still have those US dollars. So even if Ethereum goes to zero, you're still sitting on the $2,000 US, so you wouldn't go entirely to zero. And vice versa, if price of Ethereum goes up, uh, you know, you're not losing your Ethereum. So you would be gaining more money than, um, uh, than if you would in a pool. So uh, strictly speaking, uh, when you're a liquidity provider in a pool, your experience is always equal or worse than just having the original basket of assets. And uh, that especially matters to you if, if, like us, you're trying to hedge away the risk of the underlying asset. So let's say I, you know, I don't want to be exposed to any Ethereum fluctuation, so I go somewhere and uh, I short perpetual futures, um, and the the hedge will work sort of similar to the straight line. So I'll be losing money the further away I get uh, from this line. What the industry tends to call this is uh, is an impermanent loss, uh, and it's a it's really a terrible name because this loss is uh, you know bloody not impermanent at all. Uh, this is how you can measure it. Uh, the x-axis uh, where where the curve meets uh, number one is the original price, and if you move away from the original price you know, the impermanent loss increases, the distance from the straight line uh, increases. So uh, if you start at, at one, your impermanent loss is zero. If you go up 50% to 1.5, it's about two and a half percent of your original assets. If you double, uh, go to 200, uh, to go to 2.0, the, uh, the loss is about 5% of your assets and uh, vice versa. If the price starts declining, you're still looking at impermanent loss. It's kind of interesting that the 5% loss, you get the same loss if the price goes down 50% or goes up 100%. It may seem not symmetrical, but actually, you know, if you do the x-axis in logarithmic scale, you'll see going down 50% and going up 100% gets you back to the original price. So that's why it sort of works this way. In any case, this is the experience if you are a liquidity provider on version 2. Uh, in order to remain a liquidity provider, you will need the fee income that you get from trading fees to be at least equal to the losses, the impermanent losses that you are realizing here. Uh, in our experience on version two, that has been the case, and we actually have been generated uh, pretty nice uh, returns on, uh, on providing, providing liquidity on version two. Now, in the middle of last year, uh, Uniswap came up with a new version of the protocol called version three. Uh, they tried to, uh, to address what they thought was an issue. And the issue, if you remember, going back to the original curve on version 2, is that uh, version 2 provides liquidity across the whole price range, all the way to infinity and all the way to zero. And that seems a little bit silly. It seems like uh, a lot of your capital is actually not working. So uh, the team thought they would, they would help people get better return on invested capital by allowing you to provide liquidity only in a tight range. So in this case, um, this is what the pool looks like if you're only willing to provide liquidity between 1,000 and 3,000 US dollars. So the curve is kind of shifted and you see it actually intersects the axes. So you get to a point where you actually are fully stuffed with Ethereum or you're fully stuffed with USDT which cannot happen in Uniswap version, uh, version two. The net effect of that is that from a liquidity provider point of view, the, uh, the shape of the value of the pool looks like this. And if you remember what the, uh, what the version two looked like, this is much steeper and has a kind of a sharp elbow in the middle. 
And also you'll notice that at any price above 3000, you're sitting fully in USDT. You're not getting any benefit from uh, increases in the price of Ethereum and vice versa. If you, if price of Ethereum goes below a thousand, you're sitting in hundred percent Ethereum. You're not having any cushion of USDT there sort of uh, helping to ease the pain. And if you have been in finance for a while, you look at this chart and you kind of recognize that this is actually looks similar to a put option payoff chart. This is what it would look like if you sold a put option to somebody on Ethereum uh, at about $3,000. And the difference is that when you provide liquidity to a version three pool, you're getting zero premium for that put option that you just wrote. Um, here is the similar chart when we looked at the difference between just having the original pool of assets and putting them into uh, Uniswap. And you can see the distance between, two, between these two lines is much bigger than in the previous chart. So the impermanent loss, which is the difference between these two lines, is higher in version three than in version two. And you can actually compare it. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of an interesting uh, shape of this curve. Uh, it looks like when price goes down, you actually tend to be slightly better off with version three. Um, what you should, though, compare is uh, a 50 percent drop versus 100 percent increase. And the difference between these two lines is much bigger on the increase size. And the net net effect of this is that you will be losing a lot more money on version three than on version two. What we found out uh, when we were looking into version three is that the fees that you generate are not enough to offset the impermanent loss. So we actually uh, never never provided liquidity on version three, and we sort of stepped away from that market. And we were sitting there kind of racking our brain, trying to figure out why are people providing billions and billions of dollars of liquidity to version three, when we just can't figure out how to make it work. And we thought maybe they kind of understand something we don't. Uh, but it turns out that uh, no, they didn't actually. Um, this is uh, this chart comes from a paper published by the Bancor um, uh, pro project. Uh, what they did is they did a, a kind of an amazing data analysis. They went through all the liquidity pools on Uniswap version three, and they looked at the fees generated versus the impermanent loss. So the fees generated is in blue, and the impermanent loss is in orange. When the fees is lower than the uh, impermanent loss, the providers have lost money. So if you can, if you look at across all of these pools on version three, uh, basically all of them lost money uh, for liquidity providers. There are, there's a couple of tiny exceptions. I think Axia Infinity was one of them, and Phantom was another one. But the, they were they're very close, and uh, they don't even you know add up to anywhere near uh, what the losses on the big ones were. Um, it looks like um, also. Uh, the other thing that the research paper looked at is like maybe maybe it depends on uh, you know how long the money has stayed in the pool. Maybe it depends on the size of the uh, uh, of the investment. Maybe it depends on the width of the range. Uh, and I don't, I'm not going to go through all the charts, but the outcome has been that it's sort of irrelevant. All of those uh, make no difference. Basically, all subgroups of investors in version three lost money. So uh, what does that mean kind of for, for everybody? And, and what should be the takeaway from this experience? Um, the takeaway is that we as an industry should move away from Uniswap version three. Uh, and uh, sort of depending on who the audience is, uh, my recommendation sort of differs from audience to audience. For people who are like us, who are, are, who are um, hedge funds and liquidity providers, just stop providing liquidity on version three. You can't win. Uh, this game just doesn't work, and uh, the sooner we all stop, the better for everybody else. For people who are running uh, DeFi projects and they are looking to create liquidity by, gener by creating pools on Uniswap and other market makers, please create your pool on version 2, not on version 3. Your liquidity providers will have much better experience, and you will uh, it will be easier for you to attract and retain them. And uh, if you are a venture capitalist or uh, if you are a technologist in the industry, please encourage exploration of alternative AMM designs. The version three protocol is really has been a failure and we need to find uh, a better design out there and move beyond that. So 
that is my, those were my thoughts. Um, is, uh, is there a way for me to take any questions? Um, hey, thanks so much, Jacob. Um, I don't, let's see if there's anybody, this is the last talk. So I don't know if, um, I don't know if there's anybody that has questions. Um, I don't see any here. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I can, since this is the last one, maybe I'll ask a few questions here and, sure. and, and see. Um, so yeah, it is interesting at a high level that all, I mean, what kind of, how many, I mean, how, how large is the pool and how much money are they losing and why? Because that seems like the market's inefficient somehow. And is someone benefiting from the losses of liquidity providers? I assume that maybe on the flip side, it's like, okay, Hey, they're taking advantage of the V3 pool. Um, because yeah. Yeah. Liquidity providers aren't making money. <laughs> so it's it's a good question. I mean, there's tens of billions of dollars in uh, in total value locked. I, I think if you go to Info and Uniswap, uh, it shows numbers something like four or five billion dollars. I think the real number is much higher than that. If you if you spread it across the pools, so and it's been going on for close to one year now. So it's kind of amazing that um, that uh, the capital continues to be provided. I think part of the reason is that. Uh, sort of people don't quite understand what's going on because they don't hedge. And the volatility of uh, Ethereum or whatever, the other crypto assets they have locked up sort of overlays it. It's it's not easy to see these losses directly. You won't, like if you go to Uniswap website, they're not going to tell you, you know, this was your impermanent loss. They'll tell you like, oh, you generate all, all, all these fees. And, you know, your Ethereum is now worth X. Um, you know, it's not in their interest to kind of do the math for you. And I think a lot of people just don't do the math. Uh, but more and more people are realizing that, you know, something strange is going on. And sorry, okay. the second part of the question was... Uh, yeah, so uh, I guess the second part is, well, I guess uh, there is, uh, on the flip side, since the liquidity providers are losing money, those that are, I assume... Um, listing these tokens are somewhat at a at advantage maybe or like getting liquidity for free in, in or not better liquidity than they would have uh, so the beneficiaries are the traders and okay. specifically the arbitragers who are doing this uh, okay. so they are the sort of the toxic by you know if we use the uh jargon of traditional finance the toxic flow in this case are the arbitragers and they're they're eating the market makers who are the liquidity providers so the arbs are making uh, extra mm. returns because of this. Okay, I see. Okay, so okay, so so our arbitra uh, arbitrage are trying to keep this a secret, I guess. And, and the liquidity providers are saying, "Hey, like you guys, it's like, hey, this doesn't make sense." So, um, yeah, it is. It is interesting. It's you know, you, you figure that they'll, you know, a lot of these, uh, I mean, especially when you're talking large sums of money, they would look at the bottom line and 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 real and and realize that hey, they're not they're not profitable by. So the game. Liquidity. um the game has been until recently uh, sort of yield farming, right? So people were not even looking at the profitability of the underlying uh, liquidity provision as long as there was some reward token being dropped. And this is not really the case with Uniswap, which doesn't play these shenanigans. But, you know, you go to, you know, bakery swap or sushi swap or, you know, there's dozens of those things that, that attracted people to come and provide liquidity in exchange of airdropping them, you know, to tokens that could be potentially worth quite something. So that was the game where a lot of the capital went. But that's not really a sustainable game. And in order to build an infrastructure that can stay around for decades and provide these services, we have to be able to create a business model that makes, that incentivizes everybody to participate without any of these nonsense games. Okay, uh, that makes sense. And are, do you see any good designs out there out of the ones that are addressing the impermanent loss issues? And I know there's a few protocols that are doing that. And I don't know if the, is sushi swap using the same model or are they using, using the same model? They basically copied and pasted it from Uniswap. Mm -hmm. um, so version two still remains the kind of uh, the leader in there. Um, there is there's one thing I would like to mention, though, that there's, uh, you know, the nice thing about this industry, there's so much innovation. Uh, there is a group, uh, there's a protocol project um, uh, that noticed that the payoff of a version three pool looks like a put option. And they thought, well, maybe we can actually take these uh, positions and treat them as put options and take them as a building block 
of more complex option instruments. So if you have a put option and if you can find a way to actually go either long or short, then you can create a call option, you can create spreads, you can basically, uh, you can replicate any other financial product if you just have options as the building block. So there's an interesting project called uh, called Panoptic that is uh, that is built that is trying to work with that, and you know if some if there's something that Uniswap version three is good for, it may actually turn out to be an interesting building block for these things, and that in itself may then actually work better uh, to incentivize people to come back into it rather than you know straight up liquidity provision. Yeah, interesting, interesting, yeah. I mean, I, I figure though, you know, if there's something faulty with the design, that it's better not to expand on that and re create things on top of uh, something that's faulty, and maybe use kind of these, you know, just have a more basic options protocol, you know, rather than trying to make good of something that's faulty, you know. But it, it's interesting, yeah. It's, it's it's fascinating to 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 see maybe. Maybe in this bear market, you know, um, you know, uh, this this you know this kind of will be uh, more relevant, you know. So we'll, people, we'll see. People are looking to people are looking more for income and yield strategies, mm -hmm. and that's what a you know in a bear market, you know, you'll be, there's less appetite for just pure speculation, and people would just like to get straightforward income. And I think that's what will attract them back into these uh, automated market makers with their promise of providing income. Uh, but this is something that they really need to watch out for. Okay. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's good to be aware. So hopefully they fix it too. You just, I mean, it's, it's good to just reach out. I, I don't know if you've heard anything from the Uniswap team that, uh, no, uh, no, that Rick... they, they, they haven't, uh, at least they have not publicly talked about their plans. Uh, okay. it would be interesting to see, you know, if they can, uh, if they can come up with a way to, uh, to make this more attractive. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Either that or, or Jacob, you had to start becoming an arbitrager instead of a liquidity yeah. runner. I'm in the wrong business. Yeah. So, all right. It sounds great. No, thanks so much, Jacob. Uh, really appreciate it. Yeah, fascinating topic.